Sound Words, Christian Magazine, Volumes 41 to 50. Republished by Irving Risch, host of Down to Earth but Heavenly Minded podcast. Exodus, the Book of Redemption and Relationship. A. Shepherd. We will go through the entire book in 24 parts. Part 18 of 24. Exodus chapter 20. The children of Israel, having accepted the law as the ground of their relationship with God, have now presented to them in this chapter, through the agency of Moses, in a detailed and specific form. Those righteous requirements of a God who is, of purer eyes than to behold evil. Undeviating obedience to these commands, to which they had pledged themselves. Could alone ensure the continuance and enjoyment of their relationship with the only true God who desired to dwell among them. Since these commandments, commonly referred to as the Ten Commandments, were to form the basis of this new relationship, nothing is left to the vague conjectures of men. No scope or latitude is given to the human mind to arrive at its own conclusions. The Spirit of God, in explicit and unequivocal language, extends and develops each of these commandments, and reveals the solemn character of what was demanded of the children of Israel. Demands which could not be modified in the slightest degree. But the children of Israel had to learn, as we have to learn, that man in his natural state as a sinner, without the Spirit as the fruit of the work of redemption, cannot meet those requirements of God as embodied in the law. There can be no nearness to God, for man's place under law is in the distance of condemnation and death. Even a partial fulfillment of the law offers no relief from its exacting demands, nor any measure of exoneration from its inflexible conviction, for any infraction of its righteous demands invokes the penalty of the law. As James so distinctly declares, for whoever shall keep the whole law and shall offend in one point, he has come under the guilt of breaking all, James chapter 2 verse 10. In the contemplation of these solemn realities it is most blessed for every true believer in Christ to consider the benign movements of a Saviour God, one who has brought meat out of the eater, and sweetness out of the strong, coming forth in the plenitude of his grace as one who can deliver from going down to the pit, as having found a ransom through the atoning sacrifice of Christ. The law has done its needed work as God intended it should, having stripped man of every vestige of his supposed righteousness in which he so incontinently boasts. The law still stands, its authority unimpaired, and upheld inviolate by the blessed Lord, who died under its solemn curse as our surety and unblemished substitute, and made a curse for those who lay under the curse of a broken law, Galatians chapter 3 verse 13, and who, moreover, were unable to render that righteousness which God demanded under law, but who, in the riches of his grace, has brought forth the best robe of heaven, reserved from before the ages of time, and now conferred on those who had no righteousness of their own. Even Christ our righteousness, 1 Corinthians chapter 1 verse 30. In considering the commandments in detail it will be observed that the first four relate to the responsibility of the children of Israel towards God, while the remaining six define their responsibility towards man. The Lord Jesus has given us a divine summary which reveals the very essence of the law in quoting Leviticus chapter 19 verse 18 and Deuteronomy chapter 6 verse 5. To the question by one of the Pharisees, teacher which is the great commandment in the law, the Lord Jesus replied, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, and with all thy soul, and with all thy understanding. This is the great and first commandment. And the second is like it, Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. On these two commandments the whole law and the prophets hang, Matthew chapter 22 verses 34 to 40. It will be noted that these precepts are presented in a strongly negative form. It does not say, thou shalt, with the underlying assumption that man was capable of doing so. But thou shalt not, and in this is revealed the natural and innate tendency in man to do that which is evil. Man is prone to do every one of the things forbidden, otherwise the necessity to forbid them would never have arisen. What a humbling proof of man's natural tendency to delight in what was abhorrent to God. Hence the necessity for the imposition of those curbs on the movements of a nature which is, not subject to the law of God, for the mind of the flesh is enmity against God. For it is not subject to the law of God, for neither indeed can it be, and they that are in the flesh cannot, please God, Romans chapter 8 verses 7 to 8. God was dealing with Israel as the people whom he had redeemed by his mighty power from the thraldom of their oppressors, bringing them into relationship with himself, though in an outward way. Without the new birth and not knowing justification by faith. They were a people in the flesh, and had shown themselves wholly insensible of the grace that had delivered, nourished and sustained them until they came to Sinai.
they forgot God's great promises to the fathers, in which were set forth his great desire to dwell among them. In conditions compatible with the revelation he had made of himself as the I am that I am, Exodus chapter 3 verses 14 to 15. Yet this is the people of whom Jeremiah has written, not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers, in the day of my taking them by the hand. To lead them out of the land of Egypt, which covenant they broke though I was a husband unto them saith Jehovah, Jeremiah chapter 31 verse 32. Again, as in the previous chapter, we see the effect, produced on the people by the formal giving of the law, for they trembled and stood afar off, Exodus chapter 20 verses 18, 21 and expressed the desire that Moses should speak to them rather than God, lest we die. Even the words of Moses as the mediator, given of God, did not dispel their fear, fear not. For God is come to prove you, for the purpose of proving you, and that his fear may be before your faces, that ye sin not. These words, however, did nothing to assuage their fears as the following words indicate, and the people stood afar off. And Moses drew near unto the thick darkness where God was. It has been convincingly demonstrated in the word of God that, irrespective of dispensation, whether of law or of grace, distance from God can never be the ground of obedience to God. The people were at a distance from God, not merely as to their actual position as prescribed by God, but more vitally as to their moral state, which necessitated God remaining in obscurity and unrevealed. So long as the law was the basis of his relationship with his people, while God insisted on this distance which the holiness of his nature justly required, he had other and more precious thoughts cherished in his heart concerning the blessing of his people. Wholly consistent with his own desire to have his people near to himself, so that he could dwell in the midst of their praises, the expression of their love and devotedness to him. This demanded conditions of righteousness and holiness unattainable by man on the ground of his obedience to the righteous requirements of God as embodied in the law under which the children of Israel had placed themselves. This thought of distance will be brought more decisively before us when we come to consider the tabernacle, with special reference to the priests. In their priestly activities they enjoyed a nearness to God denied to the common people, yet this nearness was not absolute except in the case of Aaron, the high priest, to whom was granted once a year only. On the solemn day of atonement, entrance into the holiest of all, the immediate presence of him who dwelt between the cherubim of glory. This access to God was not without the blood of the sin offering and the overshadowing cloud of incense, in accordance with the divine instructions. These types, wonderful in themselves, yet mere shadowy representations of infinitely more precious things, will engage our hearts at a future time in their appropriate context. It is not necessary to our purpose to consider in detail the commandments presented to us in this chapter. There are certain points, however, which claim our attention as bearing on the practical ways and manner of life of the children of God in this present dispensation of grace. Take, for example, the law governing one's conduct toward one's neighbor, Exodus chapter 20 verses 16 to 17. To obey the divine injunction, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself, Leviticus chapter 19 verse 18, would ensure the observance of these prohibitions to the very letter. Though these and other commandments undoubtedly set a very high standard of conduct before those who are under law, and in outward relationship with God. How far short this falls of the conduct expected of those who are not under law but under grace. Christians are exhorted to let nothing be in the spirit of strife or vain glory, but in lowliness of mind, each esteeming the other as more excellent than themselves, regarding not each his own qualities, but each those of others also. For let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, Philippians chapter 2 verses 1 to 5. The law was the rule of life for the children of Israel, but Christ and Christ alone is the precious and unvarying standard of those who are born of God. To such Paul declares, so that, my brethren, ye also have been made dead to the law by the body of the Christ, to be to another, who has been raised up from among the dead. In order that we might bear fruit to God, Romans chapter 7 verse 4. Under the law there was no fruit for God, but under grace the new nature, growing by the true, or full, knowledge of God, becomes exceedingly fruitful as engaged with those heavenly objects in which it delights. Furthermore, in Romans chapter 8, the Apostle under the Spirit's guidance opens up to us those emancipating truths by stating, For the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus has set me free from the law of sin and of death. For what the law could not do, in that it was weak through the flesh, God having sent his own Son, in likeness of flesh of sin, and for sin, has condemned sin in the flesh.
in order that the righteous requirement of the law should be fulfilled in us, who do not walk according to flesh but according to spirit, Romans chapter 8 verses 2 to 9. Again, in Romans chapter 13 verses 8 to 10, Paul expands this truth by saying, Owe no one anything, unless to love one another, for he that loves another has fulfilled the law. For, thou shalt not commit adultery, thou shalt not kill, thou shalt not steal, thou shalt not lust, and if there be any other commandment, it is summed up in this word, namely, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. Love works no ill to its neighbor, love therefore is the whole law. With reference to the above another has remarked, by the conduct which flows from love the law is already fulfilled before its requirement is applied. In the epistle to the Galatians where the apostle is combating the pernicious doctrines of those seeking to bring these Gentile believers under law, Paul exhorts, but by love serve one another. For the whole law is fulfilled in one word, in thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself, but if ye bite and devour one another, see that ye are not consumed one of another, Galatians chapter 5 verses 13 to 15. In the foregoing scriptures the apostle does not go beyond the fruits of righteousness as manifested in our practical manner of life because he is dealing with the question of subjection to the law and of man's fulfilling it. But in the teaching of grace, as shown in the epistles to the Ephesians, Colossians and others, we reach supremely greater and more sublime heights in the expression of our love one to another. There it is seen to be the reproduction of the character of God, who is love, not merely what man should be for God as under law, but as walking according to the Spirit dwelling and delighting in all that is of God, and producing the fruit of the Spirit which is, love, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, fidelity, meekness, self-control. Against such things there is no law, Galatians chapter 5 verses 22 to 23. As partakers of the divine nature, we are to walk in the power of the Spirit of God, with which we have been sealed, for the day of redemption, a spirit who is to be ungrieved by anything that savors of the flesh. We are exhorted to be kind to one another, compassionate, forgiving one another, so as God also in Christ, has forgiven us. As God's beloved children we are to be imitators of God, and walk in love, even as the Christ loved us, and delivered himself up for us. An offering and sacrifice to God for a sweet-smelling savour, Ephesians chapter 4 verse 32, E.P.H. 5 to 1 minus 2. While humbled by the realization of how far short we come of these divine standards, let us not miss the sweetness and heavenly fragrance of these sublime statements, as God also in Christ has forgiven you. Imitators of God as beloved children, and walk in love, even as Christ loved us. Let it not be thought that this is beyond the practical realization of the Christian. For these are the features of the new man as the workmanship of God, which according to God is created in truthful righteousness and holiness, Ephesians chapter 4 verse 24. As indwelt by the Holy Spirit we have the power and the spiritual capacity to be imitators of God, who is love. What we are now considering has already been displayed in all its perfection and fullness and fragrance in the matchless life of Jesus as a man in this world. The truth as it is in Jesus, brings before us that lowly one, yet withal, the image of the invisible God, God manifest in flesh, here in the fullness of grace. Manifesting the life that was with the Father, a life essentially heavenly and eternal. This eternal life has been communicated to us, but its manifestation in us involves the putting off the old man, and the putting on the new, answering to the death and resurrection of the Lord Jesus. Christ then is the object that God has set before us, the object of his own constant delight, and as occupied with him we are changed into the same image from glory to glory, and are thus made morally capable of being imitators of God as beloved children. Let us now consider the closing verses of the chapter as bringing before us the solemn yet precious thought of worship. From Exodus chapter 20 verses 24 to 26 we learn that there are certain conditions necessary in order to worship God in accordance with his holy and righteous requirements, and to the exclusion of all that savors of man's order. The first thing concerns the manner of approach as signified in the altar and sacrifices. How precious is this thought of approach to God? We have spoken much, and rightly, of the distance and curse which the law brought in, but here God speaks of a means of approach. As he says, in all places where I shall make my name to be remembered, I will come unto thee, and bless thee, verse 24. Observe the character of the sacrifices, an altar of earth shalt thou make unto me, and shalt sacrifice on it thy burnt offerings, and thy peace offerings. One would have thought that after bringing in the law God would have spoken of sin and trespass offerings, but he does not. 
he speaks, in type, of all that Christ is, who by the eternal Spirit offered himself spotless to God, and as such was found in that path of devotedness to the will of God. In an obedience even unto death, which went infinitely beyond the obedience which the law demanded. In that path, and in that death, he glorified God where man had dishonored him, and not only so, but he glorified him about that very dishonor. Jesus delighted to do the will of God, and the perfections of his person and of his affections were seen in the fat and the breast that were laid upon the altar, which rendered his sacrifice of himself a sweet-smelling savor to God, Leviticus chapter 7 verse 30. Two altars are mentioned in verses 24 and 25, one of earth and one of stone. Various altars are mentioned in the word of God, most with the predominant thought of drawing near to God on the ground of sacrifice as worshippers. Abraham, Isaac and Jacob built altars, and these no doubt had been built of earth or stone. What is remarkable about these altars is that we seldom read of sacrifices being offered on them. At times it is simply stated that they built an altar unto the Lord, and at other times they built an altar and called upon the name of the Lord. In their typical meaning the thought was sustained that approach to God could only be through the death of Christ, who was in himself both the altar and the sacrifice. With regard to the altar of stone it is specifically stated, Thou shalt not build it of hewn stone, for if thou lift up thy sharp tool upon it, thou hast profaned it. Neither shalt thou go up by steps unto mine altar that thy nakedness be not discovered thereon. What a gross violation of God's principles we see all around us today in the lifeless profession that bears the name of Christ. Not lacking in skill, and of exquisite workmanship, their richly embellished altars bear eloquent witness to man's complete ignoring of this divine prohibition, and to his unwarranted intrusion in the holiest things of God. Man's handiwork, no matter how gifted, is not required in the worship of God, all must be according to the thought of God who must be worshipped in, the beauty of holiness. Nor were God's people to, go up by steps, to his altar. Man's pretension to approach God as a worshipper in his own way only reveals his nakedness before God. Without the righteousness which God, in the fullness of his grace, has conferred upon those who believe, man is a sinner before God, and as such cannot be a worshipper of God. The Apostle Paul in Romans chapter 3 verses 21 to 26 shows how divine righteousness is obtained, being justified freely by his grace through the redemption which is in Christ Jesus, whom God has set forth a mercy seat. Through faith in his blood, for the showing forth of his righteousness in the present time, so that he should be just. And justify him that is of the faith of Jesus. Only thus is the shame of our nakedness covered before God by God himself. This precious thought of God covering the shame of man's nakedness is brought before us immediately after Adam's disastrous fall, when, the eyes of both were opened, and they knew that they were naked. Their efforts to cover their nakedness proved unavailing, for when they heard the voice of the Lord walking in the garden in the cool of the day, they hid themselves from his presence among the trees of the garden. But in that dark and solemn hour, fraught with eternal issues for good and evil, the light of God's infinite and matchless grace shines in all its gloom dispelling power in the promise of the woman's seed, Christ, who would bruise the serpent's head, and also by God providing coats of skin with which to clothe Adam and Eve, Genesis chapter 3 verses 7 to 21. The provision of coats of skin involved the forfeiture of the life of some innocent victim, a simple yet beautiful type of Christ as the innocent victim, brought as a lamb to the slaughter and as a sheep before her shearers is dumb, so he openeth not his mouth, Isaiah chapter 53 verse 7. Thus only could we be clothed with the best robe of heaven, Christ our righteousness, and thus arrayed we stand before God in all the acceptability of Christ to God, and in all the abiding excellency and efficacy of his finished work. By Christ's finished work we are also constituted priests to God. Let none rob us of the certainty of this blessed truth, founded as it is on the infallible and unchanging word of God, that every true believer in Christ is a priest before God. Even as it is written, to him who loves us, and has washed us from our sins in his blood, and made us a kingdom, priests to his God and Father. To him be the glory and the might to the ages of ages. Amen. Revelation chapter 1 verses 5 to 6. But the place of true worship, where every believer in Christ offers the sacrifice of praise continually to God, is not on earth, but in heaven. Since the present place and position of the Lord Jesus determines the place and character of our worship. Of Christ's present place it is written in Hebrews chapter 8 verses 1 to 2, now a summary of the things of which we are speaking is.
we have such a one high priest who has sat down on the right hand of the throne of the greatness in the heavens, minister of the holy places and of the true tabernacle, which the Lord has pitched, and not man. In the true tabernacle there is no human instrumentality whatever, all is of God. What we see in the religious profession all around today is but the imitation or what God owned in a former dispensation, but which has been set aside by the coming of Christ. And by the introduction of heavenly things, consequent upon his death and resurrection, see also Hebrews chapter 9 verses 11 to 14. The tabernacle of old, with all its costly vessels and rich furnishings, was but a figurative representation of what has been established and maintained by the Spirit of God, as the scripture says. It was necessary then that the figurative representations of the things in the heavens should be purified with these, the blood of calves and goats, but the heavenly things themselves with sacrifices better than these. For the Christ is not entered into holy places made with hand, figures of the true, but into heaven itself, now to appear before the face of God for us, Hebrews chapter 9 verses 23 to 24. All that belonged to the legal dispensation was but the shadow of good things to come. How blessed to know that the shadow has passed, that the good things have come. And all are secured in Christ for us to God's glory and praise, as is written in Colossians chapter 2 verse 17, the body, or substance, is of Christ. The furniture and vessels connected with the tabernacle of old. securiously wrought by skillful workmen specially endowed by the Holy Spirit for this work. Were but types of those transcendent glories and graces which alone are found in the Lord Jesus Christ and his various offices which he adorns with the glory of his own person. All these are now seen and exercised in heaven for us, and there, in the immediate presence of God, he presents us in all the fullness of his own excellency. Another has said, Moses the servant could not bear the glory conferred on the tabernacle he had pitched, he was much inferior to that which his own hands had reared, but Christ is son over God's house and is himself its furniture and glory. And as associated with the Son, we belong to the priestly family and there we worship according to John chapter 4 verses 23 to 24. May we, as those worshippers whom the Father seeks to worship him in spirit and in truth, be preserved from allowing our thoughts to linger around the earthly shadows, or occupied in the least degree with the things made with hands, instead of those which are made without hands, and which are of God. There is yet another precious thought to be considered in connection with the altars and what was sacrificed thereon. Speaking of these sacrifices being offered, in all places where I shall make my name to be remembered, God assures his people of his presence with them in this wonderful expression of grace, I will come unto thee and bless thee. This he would do, notwithstanding all that they were in themselves, on the ground of the sweet savour of the offerings. As has already been remarked, these sacrifices partook of the character of the burnt offerings and peace offerings. The burnt offering speaks of the preciousness of Christ's sacrifice to the heart of God, all its excellence and its abiding value before him, furnishing the unchangeable basis of our acceptance before God. The thought of atonement, however, is not lacking, as the following words convey, at the entrance of the tent of meeting shall he present it, for his acceptance before Jehovah and he shall lay his hand on the head of the burnt offering, and it shall be accepted for him to make atonement for him, Leviticus chapter 1 verses 3 to 4. Sin may have been the occasion for the presentation of this offering, but the dominant thought is that, because of the superlative excellency of this sacrifice, prefiguring Christ, who by the eternal Spirit offered himself spotless to God, the sinner is accepted in all the acceptability of Christ to God, being identified with him thus, as having put his hand on the head of the holy victim, if the burnt offering speaks of what Christ is to the heart of God, as furnishing the ground of acceptance of his people, the thank offering speaks of what he became to their hearts, as furnishing them with an object of eternal praise, as it is written in Psalm chapter 84 verse 4, Blessed are they that dwell in thy house, they will be constantly praising thee.